<laughs> so guys, uh, welcome to another episode of We Interview uh, Co-Living Leaders and Community Alphas. And today we have Sam from the original Dream Factory. This is like his uh, region co-living farm, I would say, or even a small village, what you want to build. So you will present it, we will pick your brain and you can just express your idea about the future of humanity. Because I think this movement of developing alternative ways to live your life is actually happening now. So it's no longer just a dream of a few hippies. It seems that there is a movement developing just as big as back in the 60s. So a hippie 2.0 movement, but this time we have technology and I think we should utilize that opportunity. We also have Raoul uh, here from Malta. Mr. How should we introduce you? Mr. Oneness. Mr. Oneness, yeah. You can you can call me that. Yes. I'm also and Portuguese. Ladies uh, last, is not really noble from me. We have Astrid from Vagabond Co-Living in Tenerife. And she is basically welcoming co-livers, digital nomads, but as well also pushing the whole movement in Tenerife by uniting the different players because we have a lot of co-livings already in uh, the Canaries. It's, it's crazy how many are opening there. So, yeah. Now, I would say I give the microphone to you, Sam, and I uh, shut up. And if we have questions, uh, Raoul, should, or like uh, Sam, should we ask them right away or afterwards? Um, yeah, please. Okay. Sounds good. Maybe we'll put thank our you hands so much for, for having me. Yeah, sounds good. Let's just do that. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, I completely agree with what you're describing of building this kind of grassroots movements of land-based bases all around the world. Um, and so maybe I'll just start with a little bit of a background about me, um, just so we can get started from there. So yeah, I'm, I'm French and Danish originally, and um, I was living in the US for a while, and then yeah, I became a digital nomad, and I was traveling around. And I, I quickly realized that hopping from Airbnb to Airbnb in just different spaces around the world um, didn't really cut it. Like I wanted to be able to be in spaces where I could build a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. Um, and really there was like a strong disconnect between the ways that I wanted to connect with nature and the ways that was offered on the market, let's say, uh, because that's how we interact when we're just uh, at the mercy of the market when we are just hopping uh, from Airbnb to Airbnb. And so came up with this concept of developing spaces in nature um, that would enable this kind of transition into a new form of life that's more in tune with natural cycles and that kind of enables digital citizen to live wherever they want to live. Um, and so set out on this mission to develop a network. Um, we, we started OASA about five years ago. Um, we were in, in New York initially. Um, where we kind of started brainstorming about what does the future of living look like. And we kind of went from the vision of 2050. What are all the technologies that kind of affect the space? What does, uh, how do we, how is living going to be affected? And one of the big realizations was just like, well, digital nomadism is definitely going to be accelerating. Uh, remote work is just becoming a norm. And we're going to be able to basically shift the means of production to be wherever we want to be rather than having to shift uh, the labor to the cities, for example, like in the Industrial Revolution. Um, and so with that realization and also the realization that we have been destroying our planet for the last uh, centuries, but faster and faster uh, since we're getting smarter and smarter with our technology, and developing those means of production that currently are just extracting resources from the planet at at the expense of future generations. Um, so basically, we came up with this concept of developing a conservation network, where basically OASA becomes this kind of land trust entity that sits on, um, on that kind of replaces the, the let's say the, the market for for land ownership. 
And so the idea is to build a Web3 conservation network that um, purchases the lands and put them into the commons uh, and then distributes the access rights to the living spaces on those lands. Um, and so that's what we started doing. And about three years ago, we uh, we found the first property after having scouted lands in like South Africa and the US and so on. Um, and then we settled on Portugal as kind of the first space to build a prototype um, due to its, yeah, like just nice climate, access to beautiful beaches, accessibility. And there was a lot of like welcoming factors in terms of the culture and so on. Um, and so we started building yeah, what we is only called the traditional dream factory, uh, which was going to be a prototype for creating a more regenerative way of life. Um, and so the traditional dream factory is essentially it's uh, it's a, it's a DAO. We have a decentralized um, way of running it. We have uh, TDF has its own token. Uh, TDF is a uh, short hand for it. Um, and so we de started developing this token for it. Um, and yeah, and so basically with uh, well. So TDF is a it's a twenty five hectare property. It's a now and a half south of Lisbon. Um, right now, it's already been operational for the last two years, but it's a space that's being built. Um, so we we have acquired all the rights to 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 build what we want to build. We have all the permits from the municipality, and we have the token approved and so on. Uh, we established the OASA as a Swiss non profit. Um, which has a serve, which serves the purpose of regeneration and conservation of land, and TDF is the first um, manifestation of that. And so, TDF sits on this land that gets uh, put into the commons that we, by law, have to regenerate and to conserve for future generations. But anything that happens on the, those lands, say how we live together, what we're actually doing there, um, all of that is completely up to the DAO, completely up to this entity, entity that ends up uh, controlling the land in a way and then distributes the access rights to that land. And so um, TDF was an old chicken farm. Um, so there's already already 1,500 square meters of existing buildings that we've been um, slowly starting to renovate and convert. And yeah, that now we have all the permits to actually do the bigger construction on. Um, and then on in that property we're basically developing like 14 suites four studios a house uh, but also a co-working space a maker space a restaurant uh, event space a spa like we already built a sauna but we're going to build another one um, and it's also a lot around land regeneration right just like we we've stated in our purpose um so we we started reforesting we have a reforestation project we've planted about three thousand trees so far on the land um and part of the reforestation is just native forest it's like bringing back nature to, to a state closer to what it used to be before uh industrialization and like the the whole degradation of land that's been happening because of large-scale modern agriculture um and, and other parts of the land is more used for uh, food production, but in a more regenerative way. So we have like a syntropic uh, forest, an agroforest, uh, which enables us to basically grow food, but uh, from a forest. And so that's about a thousand trees at the moment. And it's uh, we use like succession planting. So initially, it's all about building biomass and restoring the soil to be able to increase actually our capacity to produce food on the land and also to simply restores the soil and um, have better, um, more ret retaining more water in our ground. Um, and, and then finally, we also set up this year like a, a vegetable production, uh, so like a small farm, and that's producing about 50% of our current needs in terms of food. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we have. And the idea is a little bit to build this kind of prototype um, as like uh, some things that could be replicated, like creating this blueprint. Uh, obviously in Portugal, one of the critical pieces is uh, water, water infrastructure. Uh, so we're building this water retention landscape. So the goal is as soon as we uh, kind of are able to expand to the to the rest of the land, um, because we, we don't own the entire property yet, we own a piece of it and then we have an option for another piece and so on. And the lakes that we want to develop would be on the on the rest of the property. 
Um, and so we want to basically develop a, a water retention landscape. There's been very good examples of that at like Tamera, for example, um, which is an old school, uh, a bit older community from the 80s that's been established about uh, 15 minutes south of where we are. And they build this water retention landscape with some advice from uh, Seb Holzer, who was a, a Austrian ecologist. And yeah, basically uh, these water retention landscapes we see as potentially the only solution to the desertification that's happening in the whole Hiberian Peninsula. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we've been doing on the ground. And I guess one last piece to then talk about is uh, so we have this land layer that we are um, restoring, conserving, and regenerating. On top of that, we're building these kind of co-living spaces and human facilities, maker spaces, uh, co-working spaces, and so on. Uh, but then on top of that, the last piece that we're bringing to the puzzle is we have this digital infrastructure. And so uh, we created basically a protocol that we call the Proof of Presence Protocol, which uh, we want to be able to scale up to other communities. So the goal is to create a little bit of a blueprint that can be repurposed by any community out there in the world uh, that is looking to issue a similar kind of model. Um, so let's say you're a community and you want to issue a token. Well, this platform enables you to distribute access rights on chain. Uh, but the interesting part about it is that um, we, we kind of found out that we want to build a governance model that's not just based on say, token holdage, uh, because there's a lot of issues with that in a current kind of DAO space. Uh, so we came up with these primitives, which is one proof of presence, uh, which is simply a, a proof of how many days per year you spend in the property. And that can become um, a primitive for doing the governance within your village. Um, so each village in our model has its own DAO, its own uh, collective decision-making um, algorithm. and and how much time you spend in the village becomes the most uh, important factor in, in governance in, in our case. Um, and, uh, another primitive that we're, we're bringing is called proof of, pres uh, proof of Sweat, sorry, which is basically just how much work you put into the project. And that's really simply measured in our case by how many tokens is the DAO distributing to you for your work. So it's just a very simple measure to be able to distribute um, the governance based on the time that you spend in the project, the sweat that you put into it, and also, of course, how many tokens you have, which is a bit more your, say, financial stake in the project. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where we are. Uh, we went live with our token to Celo, um, which is like a, a carbon negative blockchain. And so they have like very low transaction fees and it's uh, very fast and efficient. and it's an EVM compatible chain. Um, they are going to be a layer two in the near future, um, which means that it just makes it very easy to basically port this code to any any chain that you want to deploy this to. Um, and yeah, that's where we are currently. That's amazing, Samuel. Congratulations. Thank you for regenerating our, our world. <laughs> Is this something that um, Thank you. is this something that for you was a change in your life, or was it something that you always had in mind, and uh, and finally you are executing? I mean, I think I always. Um, I mean, I, I grew up first of all like in in a national park in south of France, and so I always had like a strong connection to nature. And my parents were hippies and, you know, I've grown up in these kind of uh, hippie environments and I've seen a lot of uh, communities try to be built and a lot of communities fail. And I think like, uh, like Dan said in the beginning, I think we have this opportunity right now where we have technologies that actually enable us to coordinate on a, on a larger scale uh, uh, to move into this back to the land and to actually re restore the soils but without losing a connection to the rest of the world and without sacrificing, um, say, our own productivity or, um, or anything like that. And, and after growing up in, yeah, in, in a very nature-based environment, um, then I switched to working in technology. I worked for 10 years uh, yeah, in technology companies from startups and corporates and 
all kind of sizes um, and built a lot of products and so on. And so I've always been in this inter intersection between technology and nature. Um, so I think for, yeah, it, it kind of makes perfect sense for me to, to build this kind of space, really. Like my, my dad has been building uh, spaces throughout his life and participating in these type of communities. And, you know, I've seen the issues of these type of, of projects uh, from, from the past. And, and I guess I'm trying to bring a different flavor to it that's much more geared towards a digital nomad uh, citizen and kind of the more modern lifestyle. Um, and yeah, and I think like there's a bit of an ambition to to really being able to use technology for good and for regenerating the planet. Uh, that's kind of the main reason why I entered the crypto space in the first place. It's that uh, crypto can be a force for good and we can actually change incentive to create positive change in the world. So the power of refi, regenerative finance, is that we can actually associate economic value to growth in ecological systems. Um, so currently, like the that space is mainly tracking things like carbon because that's one thing that we have markets for. Uh, but the idea is that down the road, we will, will be opening up many more markets to f things like, for example, biodiversity or water retention and all these kind of positive externalities that we can have on the planet. And my dream is that within the next 10 or 15 years, as we're going to see more and more uh, collapses and bigger scale crisis happening, that governments will be adopting this and they will be looking at on the ground what the type of project that actually having positive impact to be able to um, fund and shift financial resources towards these projects. Um, I mean, what I really like about your project, um, as you said, there are more more and more DAOs uh, popping up, talking the Web3 language, aiming to do what you want to do. But they are approaching from the top down and hope uh, first we build the technology and then out of a sudden, someone will make their hands uh, dirty. So uh, this is something really special that you can loop your learnings right back into your big concept, you know, into this. This is like super, super mm -hmm. uh, valuable. And then, of course, I just Googled how big are 25 hectares. And they are as big as like you can put. Could be like a small village with 100, 150 people living there, if you see it like from the map. So it's quite big. And how many people are you in the moment? Like how many people are building and helping and already living uh, there? Yeah, so I mean, uh, I mean, so one of the premises that we have is we're only going to be developing five percent of the land, right? So I think in the, in the long term, you could see as many as like one hundred and fifty people living in the project, even just in those five percent. Um, currently, we generally have like between ten and twenty people on the ground on a daily basis, and then we host events with up to a hundred people, basically. Mm -hmm. Um. But of course, like we're like a digital project as well. So we also have like a much bigger footprint online. And we have, for example, 60 members um, who are yeah, part of the project. Um, and what we want to have is basically just like around 300 members who own 60 to 90 tokens, meaning that they own uh, the access rights for 60 to 90 days per year. So people who basically keep coming back. And that's kind of the scale that we're looking at, like, Three, four hundred people who own pieces of this property and who keep coming back every year, um, without you know being up in the many thousands, but still have like bigger than you would uh, have in a say small village or something like that, or like a small at least co living property. Um, and then the goal is to then develop more of these spaces around the world, uh, maybe ten or twelve of these villages, and so then you have like this kind of network of aligned individuals are sharing um, like a culture and a purpose and a vision um, and this is just like our own kind of internal network but then of course we are open sourcing the technology and making that available to anyone out there that wants to start similar concepts and the vision that I have and that I see is that we're going to have more and more of these kind of global tribes that are going to be uh, kind of everywhere and then you will be able to choose where do you want to live and like which tribe do you want to belong to? Um, and you will have more and more of these examples um, 
living in in a certain uh, autonomy and each project i think it's really important that that they keep kind of uh, its own sovereignty in choosing how much they want to actually participate in the network Uh, are you um, uh, in contact with the Tamara, Tamara in uh, in Portugal, Tamara? Yeah, yeah, yeah Tamara. Uh, do you guys? Um, uh, Tamara. Yeah. Uh, do you mix the communities? Yeah, they're friends. Uh, are they... the, um... okay. oh. Sorry, go on. Uh, if we mix the communities, uh, not not. Uh, I mean. There is like some small overlaps. Like at times we have people who, for example, go and visit Tamara and then they stop by our space on the way or stuff like that. Um, I think there's a mm -hmm. bit like um, from from the core people who are Tamara, there's a bit of like a generational gap, I would say. Um, but we, I mean, we have been cross pollinating. And for example, two two years ago, we hosted this event called Rebuild, uh, which also co founded, um, which is an event for people building regenerative villages and Tamara was actually a big part of supporting that. They brought, for example, the water expert, uh, Thomas Ludet, who actually built the lakes at Tamara and the infrastructure. And so he was touring the land and giving some um, expert opinions on on, on, on our lands. Um, and we were doing some in the soil actual practices with, uh, with the participants, like digging small swales and then um, like the kitchen team was supporting and so on and so on. So we do have those bridges, um, but yeah, I would say like we are a bit, uh, a bit more on the digital side, and so I would say we have like maybe stronger ties with other projects who are maybe more digital. Don't you think it would make sense to build also a network of those places? Let's let's say you just talk about the regenerative um, eco communities, like you have some standards. And why not also unite them? Because I think they also need a technology provider. I mean, our niche mm -hmm. are classic co-living houses, okay? And they need a technology provider. And maybe this would also make sense that, uh, is this something you could imagine to be a big network connected by technology? Yeah, 100%. I mean, so... I forgot to mention, but actually, we, there's like one project that we would like to develop more on the bioregional level, uh, which is that we want to work on collaborations uh, to achieve things like green corridors. Um, so there's a bit of a dream to be able to have a green corridor stretching from TDF to Tamara. It's uh, 30 kilometers if you look on bird's eye. And so that's like the kind of collaboration that we would like to get into as well. Uh, but yeah, then about the sharing technology, I mean, our current strategy is more approaching, let's say, younger communities that are maybe a bit more open over time as the technology matures. And then, yes, and I think it's going to be much more accessible for any kind of eco village out there that um, that is looking for maybe a more easy to use solution and for having people come in. And that uh, this enables is that. Uh, you know, instead of having, I mean, Tamara doesn't have this kind of ownership model, so it doesn't really apply. Um, but for, say, like so, some traditional eco villages, yeah, you have to buy yourself a share, like uh, to be able to live there. Um, so you buy your house and so on. But that's like a very big step and it's like really hard to do and it's a big commitment. And it's like once you have it, it's like really hard to exit as well. Uh, so by tokenizing this kind of land project, it enables uh, to come in with a much smaller commitment. I mean, even if you want to own just for the time that you spend, if you, even if you just come for 10 days, now you can just buy 10 tokens at TDF and you can do that. Um, and if you don't don't agree with the community or something, at some point your value clash, then it's as simple as selling your 10 tokens. So it's like really easy, uh, easy to enter and really easy to exit. And I think that's going to make the whole eco village movement much more accessible to to the broader masses. One hundred percent. I also see it like this. But I see your specific niche exploding. You know, um, people will not just move back into a village. They want to keep their way how to approach things with technology, with their phone. You know, this will not fade away. 
So you are sexifying basically those intentional communities, which sometimes exist since 100 years. But honestly, I mean, I am a hippie, but I would sometimes not feel awkward, but how to enter this community, you know, if you have an easy way to do, then you feel welcome. So I totally get it, you know, and probably the existing ones, they mm -hmm. don't want to be tokenized, um, you know, so. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have a, some. I have an, uh, um, just a question about how do you, how you come to, for example, a digital normal wants to join your community or your your place for two months. How to, how to, how to explain, how to engage this, uh, this guy uh, with uh, just providing these big ideas that uh, you are developing there, because sometimes these are. Uh, really uh, difficult to explain uh, for a short time it's not a uh, you said about an nft but uh, probably you have other things that you uh, went uh, during the onboarding and welcoming uh, you can explain mm -hmm. a bit more yeah for sure i mean and, and i think like what we've seen this year is you know like the market for for cryptos is, is down people don't have so much money anyway like the whole economy is kind of slowing down um, regenerative finance has taken a big hit, like because like people don't believe in capital markets and all that stuff. So I think what we're building is like very much future focused, and so I think we need to have this distinction between futures that we're building for and what you can already get access to today. And so, um, there's a, like we are hosting public events. Uh, you can be like just a random Joe that has no clue about Web3 and you can still visit the website and you can still uh, come and like book a stay with us, essentially. Um, and so it's completely also okay to just stay in, in fiat for as long as you feel comfortable. Um, the Web3 component really comes more down the line once you really want to be engaged because that's how you basically can gain governance rights of the space, right? So if you want to have full sovereignty and being able to be part in the decision-making process, that's when the whole kind of crypto thing becomes interesting. Uh, if you just want to come as a, as a guest and as a visitor and, and you don't care to be paying a market rate for, for the space that you're staying in, then sure, then you can um, just have that experience. Um, I mean, obviously, like for us, like we want to incentivize for people to buy the token. And so uh, token holders and so on will have priority and, like if we have full, if we had full capacity at some point because we sold all the tokens and people are staying this way, then yeah, then you might not be able to come anymore as a simple visitor paying fiat. But at the moment, as we're building these kind of concepts, um, yeah, like regular visitors who uh, can definitely just come and whether it's for a public event and you're coming uh, just for a weekend uh, or whether it's yeah, just like coming to a more co-living kind of situation. Um, and we also have other ways to to engage with the project. For example, we have uh, volunteering positions, uh, so you can come and you can work with us, or you can come and you can do a, a residency. We have residency program. Uh, if you are like an artist, or if you're like some kind of uh, construction or sustainability expert that wants to build some kind of project at CDF, and there's like a good match. Um, so we cannot build this whole game. Like we actually called it uh, a meta game. I didn't find out there's there's already something called that, but. Um, it's kind of just this idea that uh, whatever your interaction is like with TDF, like that there is like a way for you to play and that it's easy for you to understand the rules and that you can choose how much you want to invest yourself, like all the way from just buying all your tokens and just being like fully in because you're just like completely convinced by the vision. Or maybe it's just like, oh, I'm going to come for a weekend just to to check it out. Or maybe I'll come for a couple of months and volunteer and not really have a financial exchange with the project, but I'm going to be contributing with my time. Um, so yeah, kind of creating all of these options. It really is amazing. Um, I'm thinking that this sounds very much like you could have uh, what the network state could actually be many of these villages connected through the network with a, with their own currency or, um, or that people can actually interact with that currency. But do you have um, in your mind something that in the future will go in the direction of a resource-based economy? Um, do you want to maybe just 
such a word on what you mean by resource-based economy? Um, the concept of Jacques Fresco, the concept of using technology, exactly what you're doing uh, in order to make the world a better place, more equitative, without politics and without money, mm -hmm. without any currency, really. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what we're trying to do is really just to have a base layer primitive, which is this proof of presence, mm -hmm. uh, which is only part that we really developed on chain, which just enables you to have access rights via this digital asset. And and then based on that, you can then use that primitive to do whatever you want. Like we're using it to do governance, but maybe another protocol will come in tomorrow and say, hey, we're going to, based on how much time you spent, um, maybe we're going to do something else, you know? Like um, one of those things could be something around resource allocation or like I talked a little bit about how we are tracking the growth of a forest. Um, like, actually, maybe I didn't mention, but we're tracking the growth of a forest via open forest protocol, for example. Uh, so basically, we are we are holding natural assets in our treasury, or like we're building up natural assets because we're able to track the growth of nature and the positive impact that you're, we're leaving on the ecosystem. And so those are just kind of other forms of resources that will be flowing into the network and that get... Uh, governed essentially by this collective right that uh, that the DAO is. Um, I think beyond that, I mean, there's so many opportunities for what you can do once you kind of bootstrap this kind of economy. We want to really start with the simplest primitive to get things going. And yeah, once once we have this going, once we actually manage to to get this whole project funded and so on, and and then we'll be able to invest more in the technology and, and seeing what are the next building pieces, like whether it's like, um, I mean, there's some ideas around, like, for example, having like um, kind of like a UBI coin for distributing value to the, to the local village to be able to bring other people in and give them access to the resources and, and to create these kind of positive interactions and, and more social interactions between other stakeholders in, in, the, in the direct vicinity of the project. Um, but yeah, at this point, we just kind of really focused on on building this first primitive. Nice. And you spoke about a sweet spot of 10 to 12 of those uh, nodes, places, uh, small villages. Um, do you have a time frame for this? And is this your absolute moonshot? Or if you could dream... What would be that dream in your lifetime? I mean, we know we can achieve certain things, um, but what would you say if you could dream? First question. And second, what are the blocking points to actually go there with speed? What are the blocking points for you? Those two mm -hmm. things. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I mean... In terms of the, of the scale, um, like the scale that OASA target is 100,000 hectares, actually. So we want to build 10 of 12 spaces uh, because that's kind of the number of humans that we want to have in the network. Like, And each space could have like up to 150 people, kind of trying to keep it within the Dunbar number so that there's a better cohesion within each of these uh, spaces. And we don't really want to become this megalomaniac uh, city building entity that's creating something that's out of hand we want to create like more like a sense of family and, and, and of a tribe um, so on the human scale we're trying to keep it kind of within a certain uh, scope uh, but then the objective as a non-profit is actually to acquire 100,000 hectares because we do have a lot of work in terms of conserving and regenerating work um, and so that gets a little bit more ambitious um and and the goal for these hundred thousand hectares is really to prove that we can create this kind of conservation model using mm -hmm. real estate as a way to to fund it uh, and we really see the those villages or regenerative co-living whatever you want to call them as the spaces that can be the epicenter for regeneration in the sense that those spaces will hold the technology they will hold the knowledge they'll hold the uh, the sovereignty to be able to affect a broader area and regenerate that broader area and conserve it. Um, so that's a little bit of ambition. Uh, but then in terms of the technology itself, I mean, closer, that's 
we could roll that out to 10,000 villages in the next few years or however many uh, want to happen. Um, the sky is the limit there because, yeah, technology is ubiquitous and super scalable. Um, but in terms of the kind of human tribes that we're trying to curate because we want to live in it, um, that would be like of a fixed size. Um, oh, and then the second part of the question was, oh, what's holding, holding us back? Um, yeah, so, I mean, right now it's, you know, it's a, it's a whole new way of doing real estate that we're proposing. We're offering you access rights to this digitally governed, uh, network. Well, um, each space is its own, um, entity. So basically you, you buy access right to a specific location. Um, but we need to prove this model. Uh, like now, now that we built it and we got all the permissions to 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 execute on it, next step is to be able to actually drive the market for that. And so right now we just launched a token, and it's in the middle of a bear market. And so our current blockers is like financial resources to keep being able to build out the technology and keep being able to uh, develop this first physical uh, village. Um, and then yeah, um, I could see the next two three. Uh, spaces starting to get in consideration in the next year or two, um, provided that you know the financial resources follow. Yeah, it sounds really healthy. It's, I would say. Um, yeah. It's inspiring to see there's um, there's so many of these communities already uh, around the world in different places. Um, I think that yours is, uh, the idea is quite new. It's interesting. It sounds like a very transitional method. And mm -hmm. um, I can't wait to, to see if it actually works. And when it works, I want to see this multiplying and multiplying and creating this huge tribe around the world that we are. <laughs> um, do you think that uh, somehow uh exposure to this idea would uh, inspire more people to do what you're doing i think it already has um like we're been i mean we've been at it for the last three years building for gentle villages and we hosted gatherings in portugal netherlands uh, costa rica and so on um, and a lot of people are really interested. And I mean, we're not going to take credit for inspiring everyone to do so, but I think people who land in that space, they kind of bump into a project and then they kind of expand the perception of what they're actually able to do. Um, and so, yeah, I think in that sense, there's already tons and tons of projects out there that are uh, emerging. Um, I was just recently at MetaFest in Croatia, for example, and I got pulled into a, a panel around building regional villages and half of the room was either starting or wanting to start a land-based project. And I think the more we're going to see collapses happening, uh, ecological collapses, collapses in food food delivery, uh, food, food chains and so on, uh, which are most likely going to happen in the next 10 years because the climate is getting screwed. Um, that means that we're going to really seek out these more resilient systems where we can have our own food productions and creating um, more nature around us because we, we're going to realize that nature is the greatest asset that we can basically develop. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's already happening. I think there's already more and more. And I think we're just kind of starting to dip our toes into how can technology help with this. Def definitely. I, I want to add two things here. Um, what came to my mind. So first was about, you spoke about funding. And I'm just thinking out loud, but if you would agree with an existing jurisdiction, let's say a country which needs um, traditional money, which needs fresh input, which needs young people, whatever there are certain countries they would profit or certain villages okay let's break it down and you would agree on something and you say traditionally like let's just charge 10 percent income tax from this physical jurisdiction okay 
So the average nomad will save X amount of money in a year. That money, at least a part of it, could be funneled back into the place where they are actually living, into this project. And then in the end, everyone wins. And I think this is what we should do to hack the system, you know? And this is not dreaming. There are countries they will say, yes, of course, let's do it. Why not? Um, that was one thought. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think like digital nomads in general are like um, quite a major economic force to play with in in this side of uh, the century, and and I mean, essentially everyone now can be a digital nomad, right? Like we saw during COVID that all of a sudden it's like. 90% of the workforce is just remote. So we do have this power of being able to move uh, move and basically vote with our own physical location and where we are spending our money and where we're paying taxes. And yeah, I mean, I think for, for kind of Horizon 3 kind of things, I mean, there's so many opportunities. And I think as soon as you are able to create a, a healthy, resilient system, um, you have people flocking into it and seeking this kind of, I mean, because you're providing connection, community, access to um, amazing people, access to food, access to nature. Like, there's just so many things that this can really provide for you that as soon as it's proved, I think we're going to see a lot more, yeah, like you said, digital nomads kind of moving in with it. Um I'm not really sure about the whole role of taxes and and government at this point in in our game. I think playing on the the real estate game is already big enough of a market. I think at this point, uh, considering that real estate is the number one expense in people's lives, so if we're able to divert that kind of uh, income to to something like these kind of spaces, that's already like a huge shift. I think that maybe uh, another nice game to play would be uh, in the visa area so that people from around the world can access these spots regardless of where they were born. <laughs> um, but that will need some involvement with, uh, with the authorities that allow people to come in, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, um, and th the second thing that came to my mind just to finish this one point is the market Such we are talking beautiful. about. Yeah. <laughs> I think our market, you know, it's humanity. Like there will be 10 billion people and we cannot help everyone, but it will be hundreds of million. So our market is not the Web3 market. It's about people who are done with living in the city. And I think, as you said, I think a lot of people will decide to leave the city. Uh, for various reasons, maybe also crime or just stress. You know, Americans, they are leaving the big cities, America coming to Malta. And I think we will see this migration wave happening and funneling into something better. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I'm just going to hop on from my way. laptop because my phone is low on battery. Oh, okay. There you go. But I think <laughs> we can also wrap it up. Uh, Astrid? We need your input. Maybe you have some inputs or you want to add something. It sounds like a good alternative to the current social um, uh, product, what's happening in the, our society. Maybe if we can build something that allows us to say no to that, that would be already a big way forward. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a huge opportunity here for, yeah, rebuilding our relationships to nature, rebuilding our relationship with each other, rebuilding our relationships to work. That is not this kind of nine to five kind of dogma. Um, yeah, basically all the areas of life. And I think it's it's really hard to kind of narrow down what is the impact that you can have when you're building this kind of physical space because you're really looking at a holistic picture, right? And and yeah, I think the dream is a little bit that if you can prove that you can live regeneratively in a space, then then you crack the the model because then you can just replicate that and 
the more people will be adopting this kind of lifestyle, the more regeneration will be happening. And I think that's, yeah, the beauty of it. Um, and for sure, like all of these digital networks, I mean, they're emerging, they're going to be more and more powerful. Um, I was listening to, to a podcast also there around the role of L2s and the kind of the future of, of blockchain. And I think more and more it's looking like you have this kind of digital tribes who are trusting certain digital entities to kind of host their data and to host their sovereignty and host their value. And, and I think building this kind of coordination tools and this kind of um, systems that can provide with your basic needs based on networks of value. I think that's really an interesting future that that is worth building for. The digital, you... nomads, digital nomads are struggling a lot uh, from where they were born. They were born. Um, it's not only about related to market, it's not related to, but to rights. And this is something uh, really, um, uh, yeah, is how how we can how we can help in, in some way uh, with our technology, the rights that we have already in this Europe, or and to provide these tools, new tools to uh, the people in Africa, in America, in other in other countries. But uh, they are struggling a lot. Even the Europeans are struggling a lot with the different uh, taxation, you no, know, between north and south, and it's something. Um, uh, this project, your project, and uh, other projects can help for that just to um, to help for to to have the to, to provide the rights for everyone and uh, and regenerate itself the humanity, not only the land and not only the physical things. To tear down yeah, the I borders. Think we, I think we hold a responsibility to to come up with more positive systems. I mean. We we have that uh, freedom and the capacity to, to to build positive systems, and I think it's kind of our last ch shot. I mean, if we don't solve this kind of global coordination for the civil civilization, I don't know what's going to happen. But I mean, the planet is on the verge of collapse. Secret Service doesn't want that you speak the truth. It's like a running joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have. <laughs> We have a conversation and the person says something important, the connection breaks. So say it again. It's incredible. <laughs> systems on the verge of collapse. Um, I think it's too... Oh. Yes, you're you, you, you were breaking off. I love that running joke. Um... No, you're back. <laughs> it's, yeah. I guess uh, the aliens interrupt the flow there. Yeah. It's the CIA. It's up to, it's on to <laughs> us, man. <laughs> um... Um, but yeah, I think I... we're all here to, to create more positive systems and to, to pioneer new ways of coordinating humanity basically and and it's our responsibility to to really live up to to that legacy that we have um there's not going to be many more generations after us if we continue to fuck it up at the current rate 100 percent um you were mentioned and you mentioned repeatedly our connection to nature needs to be regenerated our as in humanities um what do you think that the roles of psychedelics in this could uh, could help humanity? I mean, I think the the bigger uh, the bigger narrative that's been breaking down our civilization is the story of separation, and for I think for anyone that has done psychedelics is like you experience that separation, that wall of separation completely dissolving. So I think if you can really have that experience, it's a way for you to to embody what does that actually mean and to then reflect on that. And so for sure, I think this experience is something that can, yeah, just for, for people that need it to, in order to 
to reconnect with the fact that they are not just like this standalone entity. We're just systems within systems within systems, and we have to recognize that. And I think technology is just another layer of that, right? We're building more systems within systems, and it's all networks and everything from our brain to our body to to everything that surrounds us. It's all just nested systems, and and I think yeah, psychedelics is one way to be able to visualize that. Um, and to be able to actually work on it and and to deprogram ourselves and separating from that story of the ego which holds everything and which is the sole tr- source of truth to to a bit more of a critical thinking approach to it of really considering what is my space in this environment and what am I really interacting with and is this really me like is this like are you really all the microbes that are in your gut? Are you really all the microbes that are crawling on your skin? Like we are just composed of so many pieces of life that, yeah, the story of separation needs to be broken down. And and the more we can do it, the more often and the the more we will be able to understand how what what life is about and what we can do for for this for this moment beautiful thank you thank you samuel thank you nice conversation um how do we feel should we wrap it up or i mean everything what sam said is true and i think we don't need to take we don't need to force people to take psychedelics it could also be enough to spend one month in a co-living Honestly, but then it just takes longer, you know, to uh, to reprogram. Um, yeah, so uh, there are different ways. But I think a nice co-living community is also a good tool towards developing this understanding over time. Um, yeah. And spending time in nature as well. Of course. Um, we could collaborate uh, in sending a message of unity. Uh, I, I'm organizing an event uh, the, on the 30th of September. Uh, and uh, if you would like to give a, a small talk explaining what you're doing, you'd be very welcome. But I can maybe send you a message later about this. Sounds great. <laughs> Please do. All right. Nice, guys. Thank you. Um... I hope we gave a good impression about who you are, your why, your dreams, and what we are saying here will happen. I am 100% sure because there is no other way, no matter if it's climate change or digital IDs or society goes crazy. There are different ways we need to build the exit strategy. Right now, the majority of the people will say we are crazy. In five years from now, they will be thankful. Hug us. Um, same story like the nomad visas. Um, so this will happen and we can do it and yeah i'm out of words Raoul, you say the last things thank you and love <laughs> thank you so much 